was an abrupt cutoff, but okay. I'll go with it. <laughs> Good afternoon. All right, so generally speaking, um, while I haven't been tea keeping code totally current, I think I'm more or less current on uh, the things that people have sent in, if they've sent them in, hint, hint. There are a lot of blank spaces out there. If you're out there in cyberspace, not physically showing up, uh, you want credit for the class, turn stuff in. All right, so. Do you usually always send an email back if you get something? Not always, but if, we see, if it's sent by email, then I can usually backtrack it and get it. Because the, the sheer volume of like sending things back, I haven't when automated I that. I usually send it to my own email and ignore Good. the email okay. just to see that it got somewhere. Good. Yes, that's good. Because mostly I've been keeping the spam filters clear. Most people have been about that. So the midterm goes out this Thursday, physically and electronically. Uh, think I can be be able to arrange an electronic administration on the site. So generally it's take home open book and online probably I'll do, um, yeah, I haven't fiddled with the settings, but maybe, you know, give you two attempts on that. So, so it'll be inclusive of everything up to that date. And then the final will be, the first half of the final will be the midterm. Because they're basically certain things I want you to get because the goal is to become less addictive, if you can. So, due back one week from that date, if not done electronically, which will mean you'll have it done immediately, and you actually even, I think, be set up to see what your grade is on it immediately. Two. So, the pre-cap, uh, we're basically looking at money addictions, overspending, gambling, chronic debting, paycheck to paycheck living, credit cards, uh, all those different forms of money addictions. Uh, and then looking at a model for health, the money health budget, the money cartography, uh, defining poverty and wealth. So for example, when we talk about financial independence, what that means, uh, one of the ways is to look at where you are, where are you and where do you wanna go um, and kind of think about what that would be like financially. That means an income. So for example, if you're an addict, and let's say this is a Eugene heroin habit, so $200 a day, and that's the low end, low ending that, $200 a day times a, every day for a year is about $73,000, which goes towards their habit. So when you think about what junkies do, I mean, that's a lot of creativity with no job, to come up with that money every day, you know, having to steal it, hustle it, whatever they do to, to get it every day, and that's basically minimum wage for a doctor, many professionals. So see what would happen if you took all that energy and basically had it go towards something productive. So somewhere around 20% of the United States population uses illegal drugs. And that means we consume 50% of the illegal drug output of the planet. So that's not just things that are produced here, but things that are produced elsewhere sent to this market. Robin Williams once said, I guess he was being funny and maybe speaking from a little bit of experience, uh, cocaine is God's way of telling you you're making too much money. Or dare, drugs are really expensive. Yeah, right. So if we look at the legal economy, so you can see within you know, a drug context, if people learn their money skills from dealing and middlemanning in the underground economy, 
because it's illegal, yeah, you, a little bit of effort can make you a lot of money, but you can't put it in a bank. And so that doesn't necessarily give you a skill with using money except to essentially buy things at a large scale kind of off books without paying taxes on it or whatever. And I'm not say, suggesting that you know paying taxes alone gives you money skill, but it's a start. Now, one of the things that happens with the legal economy that's addictive is that 70% of it is driven by consumer spending. Okay, and so the very dictionary definition of a consumer, you use something that you don't produce, you use it up, and you have to get it again, and get it again, and get it again. And that's 70% of our economy. So that depends on people having like a regular income to be able to pull that off and other people having a regular income to produce all that stuff. Like I'm always annoyed, not so much around Christmas time, but the thing that would annoy me about Christmas time is like having all this wrapping paper, which really fascinates two year, two year olds, right? They like tearing up presents. They are more fascinated with, you know, like a one, my one year old granddaughter was more fascinated with the paper, <laughs> that sound, than the actual gift, which, you know, most of that stuff, even if it's cool and educational, is plastic stuff from China, as an example, right? And when we look at <laughs> consumer spending, you know, how much of that is sustainable in the long run, either on the, in in the, on the individual level or on the large to social level? So there's also an informal economy. Now, the informal economy is not all illegal, but some of it is. And so what it consists of is basically transactions that c occur off the grid. So that's an estimate uh, in the United States of about eight to nine percent of gross domestic product, which is what GDP is, which is about a trillion dollars, which is still a fair piece of change, you know, when you consider the global economy. So uh, if you want to like do kind of some either extra credit or I'm just making the offer for extra credit, you can just actually see this movie online. It's, it's a, there's a sustainability question and the, it's basically a movie called The Story of Stuff. It's about 20 minutes. And one of the things it talks about is like, okay, how do we get to this consumer-based economy? And that basically, it, when you consider that, I remember in the 60s and 70s when people were talking about overpopulation and they all, almost always talked about overpopulation as if it weren't happening in the United States, it's happening in third world countries, blah de blah de blah de blah. Well, every kid that's born in America is the ecological equivalent of 30 kids born in India in terms of their effect on the planet. So we have 5% of the world's population and we consume more than half of the world's resources just to sustain our lifestyle. All right, and so one of the problems with that is if we're basically polluting, I mean, the amount that goes to make our computers. Computers are toxic as far as, you know, producing, you know, a, a clean product. They're not clean products at all. So we're the largest consumers of uh, computers, users of computers, one of the largest ones. And, you know, if you were to reduce the world's population to a village of a thousand people, population-wise, no one would have a computer. So the fact that we do, right, gives you an indicator there. And so if the war rest of the world wants to be like Americans, uh, we ain't got enough planet to do that. But maybe we don't have to worry about that for another, oh right, global warming. Are we having storms? that are like huge now? Hmm, we are. 
Oh, that's a myth, right. I gotta watch who I'm channeling. So your assignment, how I spent my week. So on a daily basis, you know, track the every penny, including bills, books, snacks, gas, etc. The purpose is at first simply note where your money goes, and looking at it is the first step to making changes. Uh, and this is essentially what we call in prevention a harm reduction approach. Now the reason we do a harm reduction approach, and I gotta say this in terms of looking at what, what harm, produ harm reduction is, is saying, okay, there are a certain amount of people, if they're using an addictive substance that could kill them at any time, they may or may not quit cold turkey. They just may not. And even if they decide to, depending on what the drug is, it might be dangerous for them to do that. So we'll do a harm reduction approach. This is kind of the science behind needle exchange. Okay, we'll give you clean needles so at least you're not transmitting HIV or hep C or whatever. We're not gonna give you your dope, but at least if we teach you how to use the needle correctly, not develop bruises, not develop side infections, that's better than basically locking you up. And so we'll do outreach. And the data show that basically you get more people into treatment and quitting doing it that way than simply arresting them. Because treatment works so well in jail. You know, treating a medical problem using the criminal justice system has been proven so effective. But you know, there's another piece where a lot of people have what they have. You know, what in an African American context, we have a saying: "It was so bad it got good to them." Okay, where a person is basically they're drinking a fifth of vodka every day, and that's normal behavior for them because that's what their mom and daddy did, and that's what their siblings are doing, and that's normal behavior. So, okay, that may be normal behavior where. You know, in the businesses you worked in, if that was your business, but if you show up here or you show up at a business where that isn't cool, they'll tell you, they'll fire you or say, no, you've got to quit. You can't come here drunk. And even if they stop drinking, you know, at that level, when you're drinking a fifth, that's essentially binge drinking. You can't detox that within the day of work if you stop at midnight, right, the time clock. So even if you show up like here at 10 or 11, you're gonna still reek, even though you might not drunk, be drunk, right? Because your body's still eliminating. So people tell you to stop. So what would you do? You stop cold turkey. Well, you can't do that because it could kill you. But it's alcohol, it's a legal drug. Okay, no. All right, so if we do good consumer education, Harm reduction would say, oh, what you should do is actually titrate down. That doesn't make sense, but titrate down or go to a place where you can be medically detoxed. And if you're going to go cold turkey, then they can give you the meds to keep you from having withdrawal seizures, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reason I mention that is because I know I'm reaching a lot of people who are just tuning into this randomly, and there are a lot of people in that boat with your loved ones, you know, drinking the vodka or the case of beer or whatever, titrate down or do a medical detox at a facility if you're gonna go cold turkey, because alcohol can kill you. Either overdosing or going cold turkey from a really high dose, which you may think, oh, well, a bottle of vodka, that's nothing. Well, it's a lot. So harm reduction, basically saying, okay, we're just recognizing human behavior. They may not do what's optimally best for them right up front. Okay, so we'll say, okay, we'll use, you know, medical science to say, we'll meet you halfway. And, but this is the goal. Quit your harmful behavior as much as possible. By, and we'll do that by building kind of more positive stuff. So any budget reflects your priorities. And if you feel your money circumstances dictate to, you, dictate to you, rather than having you dictate your circumstances, plan to change them. And so first, of course, you have to know where you are. 
And then eventually, um, somewhere near the end of the class, we'll talk about, you know, I have a little handy chart about um, this different wage levels, uh, where, where you want to be eventually uh, in terms of income if you're shooting for a particular financial goal uh, through working or um, Doing what doing what you love might if that, if doing what you love doesn't pay you what you need you can think about augmenting that. So knowing where you are, so the assignment is essentially to show you where your money's going and where potential leaks are, and then controlling the leaks. So impulse buying is usually a big one, and actually, there you know when you talk about the four P's, there's a reason why things are placed next to the cash register. That's a set up for impulse buying. Oh, yeah, I just went to Barnes & Noble to get a couple of books for a kid's birthday and wound up buying a Rolling Stone because it had the bomb store on the corner. And then the Newsweek had the pot barons, you know, this guy in a suit and tie next to a medical marijuana grow. It's like, okay, well, I know all this about this anyway, so really, do I need to get this? But, it looked good, so, all right. <laughs> Spent $30 more than I probably needed to, but hey. It's tax deductible, right? So where are you headed? Where have you been? And where are you now? So if you look at money addictions, the addictions field hasn't really addressed money except that they want it for you from treatment. <laughs> so gambling, for example, is an addiction involving money, involving your uh, brain reward system. And just like, you know, g does gambling treatment while advocating abstinence from gambling teach money health? Well, the model that we use is no. We're just basically using a specific problem to address your gambling, not teaching you overall money health skills. So again, if we look at a more comprehensive thing, as I say to lots of people that come to my office, look, the field stopped just being alcohol and drugs 30 years ago. We've had to address a whole bunch of other stuff as a result of things that other people weren't dealing with. You know, We had to basically deal with people's sex lives because of AIDS. That gave us an, in, an instant in where, okay, we could just focus on preventing this infection, but now we're looking at, oh, this is a recovery issue because you were loaded when you got laid and now you're not getting loaded. You don't even know how to have a real relationship. Oh, we don't do relationship school, right? So starting to try and put those things in place. And that means even after you're in recovery, I still might see you years later, for some people, if it's not being addressed out there for, you know, you going through stages in your relationship in recovery, if you're both recovering at different rates, right? Because people will shift their addictions quite predictably and cleverly. So teaching money health. We haven't really begun to do that. So if we look at in our society who does teach money health, Sometimes schools, sometimes banks, government, credit card companies, finance companies, and other businesses, but they usually only do it after you've gotten in trouble. Never before to prevent trouble. And that's been kind of an ongoing issue that I've been kind of fighting behind the scenes along with other people. Okay, we don't teach people how to deal with their financial aid because that's usually the biggest, the first biggest loan situation that they've ever encountered in their lives unless they're already homeowners or unless they've already bought a car on, on time and credit. They've never had that much money to begin with. So what happens? They run into predictable problems that could have been prevented if we had taken the time to do that. So the argument has been, well, whose role is it to do that? and round and round and round without actually teaching you how to do that.